This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. I'm Sophie Ikenye. Our top stories. Away with the past, the party of Sudan's ousted president Omar al-Bashir is abolished and a decency law targeting women is repealed. 90% of young children in Zimbabwe don't have enough food, so says the United Nations. What kind of future awaits them? Using chalk to talk, Kenyan women tell their stories of sexual harassment on the streets. Also in the program, No Less a Woman. We hear from three breast cancer survivors who went through a mastectomy. I never lost my self-confidence and esteem. I think it shows. And FIFA president Gianni Infantino unveils plans to build a stadium in every African country. More in sport. Thanks for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Sudan has dissolved the former ruling party of ousted President Omar el-Bashir and repealed a public order law largely seen as a way to police women's behavior. Now, the two measures announced by the transitional authorities are in response to key demands by the protest movement that helped overthrow Mr. Bashir in April. Well, the BBC's Mohanad Hashim has this report. A 14-hour marathon meeting and two radical measures announced. Sudan's sovereign council and cabinet have moved to abolish the National Congress party of the deposed president, Omar al-Bashir. One of the key demands of the protest movement that saw his overthrow after three decades in power. The justice minister says the party's assets will also be confiscated. The second law, and the most important one, is in accordance with the constitutional document, which aims to rebuild the Sudanese state by dismantling the June 30 regime and ending the empowerment of the regime. This law directly dissolves the National Congress Party, as well as confiscating all the assets and money owned by the party and all the other institutions belonging to it. These assets will be under the control of the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning. In another widely welcomed move, the public order law, which was used to impose conservative Islamic social codes, has been scrapped. The rule applied to indecent acts in a public place, acts contrary to public morals, obscene outfits, or causing annoyance to the public, in effect targeting women by restricting freedom of dress, movement, association, work, and study. Activists say thousands of women were arrested every year and flogged for indecency or subjected to fines, and that the law was applied arbitrarily. Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok tweeted that the laws of public order and public morals were a tool of exploitation, humiliation, violation, violation of the rights of citizens and the violation of the dignity of the people. But not everyone is happy with the decision. Members of the dissolved National Congress Party are outraged, saying it is a moral scandal and describing the transitional government as illegal. They warn the move will spark chaos and instability. The current Sudanese government will remain in charge for the next three years pending elections. And while some have described these reforms as a major step towards building a democratic state, implementing them will be a crucial test of the transitional government's ability to overturn 30 years of al-Bashir rule. Well, let's talk to Hala Al Karib, who is the regional director at the a Strategic Initiative for Women in the Horn of Africa. She's in Khartoum. Thanks for taking time to talk to us on the program. Now, these restrictions were not just about how women dress, decency, but also about association, work, study. What was the impact of that on women? Well, you know, these restrictions that are actually sitting in Sudan uh, Criminal Act, which is still there, you know, although the public order law is repealed and we are quite relieved and happy 
that you know the brutal arm of um, the Sudan uh, discriminatory uh, Sudan Criminal Act is being rebuilt, and 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 we are hoping that you know the changes will actually uh, go all the way to change and amend Sudan Criminal Code. Um, but I mean, we're we're relieved that at least you know hopefully that uh, the the public order police and the public order courts will be um, dismantled and disintegrated. You know, we are also hoping as activists who struggled and suffered of these laws for, you know, and as women for the past 30 years, that Sudan will really take a, ser a serious look towards its criminal act, you know, its family law and all the set of discriminatory laws that are based on terror, and on militancy and dogma, and they were all specifically targeting women. Mm. So, so you, you still need more to be done when it comes to the criminal law. Um, the former ruling party, this was also part of what was discussed and decided on by the authorities, the former ruling party is, is really no more, but they are quite defiant. In fact, some of them say the party is not bothered by any law or decision issued against the NCP. Um, the NCP is a strong party and its ideas will prevail. What do you make of that? How do you get to read or dissolve ideologies? Well, I think, you know, um, it's, uh, the, the NCP has ruled Sudan with an iron fist for over 30 years, in poli employing uh, political and, and militant Islam and, and very, very dogmatic, you know, um, 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 ideology, terrorizing people and using religion you know, sort of to tidying their fist, you know. But I think the Sudanese people, they are becoming extremely aware at the moment. And, and I honestly don't see, you know, that um, the NCB would have any ideological influence um, on Sudanese uh, people as a political party. However, you know, um, uh, we have to acknowledge that the heavy heritage, you know, um, that was left behind in terms of you know, uh, how people approach their face, how do they approach, you know, the gender relation, the polarization that happened in the country, mm. leading to war, to buckets of war and conflicts across Sudan are all challenges, you know, that Sudan is faced with and we have to confront. All right. Uh, Leili um, Hala al Karib, thanks for taking time to talk to us on the program. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, hundreds of Zimbabwean doctors have rejected a government ultimatum to return to work in the next 48 hours without having to reapply for their jobs. They were dismissed after a court ruled their strike for better wages was illegal. The protracted strike has closed down all national state hospitals and claimed lives as the sick are being turned away. Well, let's stay in Zimbabwe, where more than 90% of the youngest children in the country do not get enough food. That's the sobering report uh, from the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. Hilal Elva says the country is on the brink of man-made starvation and that 60% of the population are considered food insecure. So just what does this mean for Zimbabweans? Let's go live to Harare and speak to Leili Moshiri, who's UNICEF's a representative in Zimbabwe. Thanks for taking time to talk to us on the program. Are the findings of this report a surprise, given the economic situation in Zimbabwe? Uh, well, uh, the findings are not a surprise, but uh, of course we have to be uh, careful in the use of some of the definitions uh, to make sure that they're accurate to reflect uh, uh, the situation. But uh, I can say that the situation in Zimbabwe is not uh, a happy situation and it poses great risks to, to children's health and development. So what are the development uh, implications uh, to children getting enough, uh, not getting enough nutrition? Uh, well, uh, malnutrition of children is not just about uh, getting uh, uh, enough uh, and appropriate food in, in their bodies. It, it's also affect by, affected by many other factors. Uh, how often you feed them, uh, uh, when they get sick, what you do to them, uh, what is the environmental conditions that can prevent uh, uh, cases of diarrhea, for example, that can really plunge children into malnutrition. 
So it's affected uh, by a number of variables. Uh, food, of course, is also one of them. And when we look at the situation, if, uh, if in a family is insecure, food insecure, the like, likelihood of a child uh, becoming malnourished also increases. But there are many other factors. Mm. So um, it's a it's a wholesome it's a wholesome a wholesome look at it. Do you see though the willingness by the authorities there, by government there, to see things change? Uh, well, I think uh, my, when we speak to them, of course, they uh, express uh, that they would like to see things change. I think uh, nutrition um, uh, is is considered as a priority, although we think it should. Uh, uh, be higher uh, uh, on the agenda of the government, but uh, I think that uh, children need uh, need the attention they deserve, and uh, this is what we're concerned about because uh, uh, Zimbabwe has gone through a lot. The, mm. the social sectors have really been uh, impacted, and it's becoming a bit too much for the population to cope, and especially for children, uh, uh, it's a it's a big burden. All right, Lily Moshiri, thank you very much indeed for your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as the world marks 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, a campaign which runs every year from November 25th, young women in Nairobi's Kibera informal settlement have decided to make their voices heard, but in a different way. In its campaign dubbed Chalk Back, dozens of young women have documented their experiences of sexual harassment on a daily basis by using chalk on the road and canvases in the hope of changing attitudes. BBC's Esther Akelo Ogola reports. Out in their numbers. Armed with chalk and markers, they brought their experiences to life. Girls fighting street harassment, the memories of the hurtful words used against them, etched on the road and on canvas. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. Um, what are you writing there? I am writing about stopping street harassment. And I can see here you've written Chirahi, which in regular Swahili translated into English means frog. But does it mean something else here in Kibera? Here in Kibera, it means prostitute. Okay. Uh, Malaya, basically um, a prostitute. Would you, is this something you hear on the regular when you're walking along the streets? You can't walk down the street around here without someone saying something nasty to you. What are some of the other things you would hear and how often would you hear them? Mostly when you're walking around and there's a group of men, the men will start commenting on the women's behinds and ranking them as reward points and referring to their bus as packets of milk. But is the message that things need to change coming through? It's something we are used to. Our mentality is that a girl has to talk to you, and if she refuses, you abuse her. As we have learned from this campaign, we will change. We are grateful because uh, most of us boys and young men, we are educated, we are enlightened about this GBV. We, are, we, now, we, are, we, now, we now have information on how to, to, to deal with it. Campaigners hope that movements like this one will help give victims of sexual harassment who had lost their voices a chance to claim them back. Uh, girls are vulnerable, uh, mostly in uh, public spaces like uh, the streets. And uh, in most cases, when harassment happens to them, they don't have the power to talk about it. So at times when uh, they are so stressed, it can lead them to even commit suicide. But giving them a chance, like what we've done today, they express what they want to express uh, through chalk, and uh, no one will judge them for that. As the world marks 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, many agree that conversations such as those generated by the Chalkback campaign will go a long way, albeit slowly, to change attitudes about sexual harassment. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Still to come, the search is on for Unai Emery's successor at Arsenal. But who would the fans prefer? Find out more in sports.
I'm Sophie Ikenye and you're watching Focus on Africa from BBC World News. The top story on this program, Sudan's transitional authorities have dissolved the party of former President Omar al-Bashir and repealed a restrictive public order law that controlled how women acted and dressed in public. And in our final series on cancer treatment in Africa, we meet three women from Zimbabwe, Kenya and Malawi who've had, uh, had a mastectomy, uh, that's the removal of one or both breasts to prevent their breast cancer from spreading. They tell us why going through the operation never made them feel less of a woman. I never lost my self-confidence and esteem. I think it shows. The minute you want to have a conversation with me, the first thing I'll say to you is, I am really special. I have one breast. Would you like to see it? Yes, I lost a breast because of cancer, but no, it has not made me any less of a woman. I am strong, I am confident, I am a mother, and I am a leader in my own space. My name is Makosi Musambasi. I'm from Zimbabwe. I have a single mastectomy, and that happened in 2017. So when I was told I had breast cancer, I, I knew that my breasts, in, in my own uh, opinion, both of them had to go. So that was freaking me out. But post mastectomy, when I woke up, because I had a reconstruction. So when I woke up and there was something there, minus a nipple, yes, you kind of feel um, slightly incomplete as a woman, but you're, you're so grateful. I was so grateful that I've been given a second chance at life. So the first thing I said to myself, what is a breast? Um, my name is Lakindanu. I am a Kenyan. I am a breast cancer survivor. I went through a single mastectomy back in 2008. It has been a challenge even up to now because, uh, you know, being vulnerable to someone, it's, it's um, it's not easy, but it's something that I have chosen to let everyone know that uh, when I meet someone or a new person, I'll always tell them upfront that I am a breast cancer survivor who has lost one breast. And, um, you know, so that we can take it from there. My name is Blendina Kondoe from Malawi. I'm a breast cancer survivor. I had a single mastectomy in 2013. The breast removal did not make me less of a woman. Um, I didn't feel any different because my husband actually told me that I did not marry your breast. I married you for you. So I've met so many women who have gone through breast cancer and the first thing I say to them when they come to me and say, the doctor said it's cancer, I always say to them, it's not a death sentence. Amazing. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. Let's find out what's happening in the world of sport, Peter. Many thanks, Sophie. And FIFA has announced plans to raise a $1 billion to build at least one stadium meeting international standards in each African country. FIFA President Gianni Infantino was talking in Lubumbashi during the 80th anniversary celebrations of DR Congo side in TP uh, Mazembe. He says FIFA wants African football to shine and will work with the Confederation of African Football and other stakeholders to improve refereeing infrastructure and competitions on the continent. Another plan includes creating a professional and elite group of African referees who will be independent of administrative and political bodies. Now it's the start of the Champions League group stages today. One game is in its final minutes. JS Kabili of Algeria are leading 1-0 over Vita Club of the DRC. Sudan's Al Hilal kicks off against FC Platinum of Zimbabwe in just a few minutes. Several North African derbies to watch out for in the next few days. On Saturday, Raja Casablanca of Morocco host Tunisian side and current champions Esperance, while Widat Casablanca go to USM Algiers. Now, Arsenal have begun their search for a new manager after Unai Emery was sacked following last night's loss to Eintracht Frankfurt in the Europa League. The Spaniard, who uh, previously led Paris Saint-Germain to the French League title and won three Europa Leagues with Sevilla, was appointed Gunners boss in May 2018, succeeding Arsene Wenger. But results have not gone his way, with the Gunners not winning any of their last seven games. We asked some Arsenal fans on the continent who they'd like 
like the club to bring in. Matut uh, Tulong Chadop in Benchu Town in South Sudan says, I think Brendan Frazier, I think he actually means Brendan Rogers there, uh, currently at Leicester City, could be the perfect man to replace him and bring happiness back to the Emirates Stadium. Akua Forlan Olivier in Sierra Leone says, Emery's sacking was long overdue. Maurizio Pochettino is the right man for the job. And finally, uh, Mutiaba Ricky has a warning. He says, I don't think sacking the manager is the issue. The board should put in more money and bring in good players. Well, the Premier League continues this weekend. Brighton and Hove Albion are the latest in line to try to end Liverpool's unbeaten run in the league. And the team's Nigeria international defender, Leon Balogun, says they won't be intimidated by last season's runners-up. Liverpool is just another chance to show where we're at as Brighton right now. I mean, they are unbelievable this season, to be very fair. It feels like they're even better than last year. Um, and Anfield, it's not easy to, to guess something there, but... You start every game with 1-0 in your pocket already. The least you can do is hold on tight to that. Um, but the way I, I know my team and I know the manager, we're not going to approach like, you know, we're just trying not to get beat. We're going to go there to win and hopefully we can, we can uh, kidnap something over there. Now, two Africans have made the uh, nominees for the sport, BBC Sports Personality of the Year World Star of the Year Award. Kenyan runner Elliot Kipchoge, who last month became the first athlete in history to run a marathon under two hours. And South Africa's Rugby World Cup winning captain Sia Kolisi made the six-man shortlist. Sophie, that's your sports. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Now we continue our series exploring the rich history of the African continent. In the second episode, Zainab Badawi travels to northern Nigeria to visit Kano. It's one of the oldest states inhabited by the Hausa tribes. And she's granted a rare audience with a local king. Kano, which was established at the foot of the Dala Hills, based its wealth on agriculture, trade and manufacturing and was renowned for what became the biggest market in West Africa, the Kurmi market. In the early 19th century, a major upheaval took place. There was an Islamic revolution across West Africa, including against the ruling dynasties of the House Estates, led by pious men, supported by the local populations who resented the greed of their rulers. New ruling dynasties were established in the House of City States, and they became emirates, paying allegiance to the Sultan of Sokoto. The emirs still enjoy high status, as I discover when I visit Kano's current emir, Mohammed Sanusi II. Every Friday, the emir of Kano will come and sit here and he will receive his guests. I have always wanted to be an emir. And, and I've always um, considered this to be my dream job. We do not necessarily have a constitutional role. We have continued to exert a lot of influence and uh, a positive influence and uh, we continue to play the role of justice of the peace. People still come to us. If you uh, come to the courts, people still come to us. They come with cases, marital cases, civil cases, commercial cases. The Emir of Kano regularly goes out to meet his subjects. And today he's setting off to the village of Tofa. When the emir arrives, he hands out certificates to graduates of a Quranic school meticulously, one by one, in a long ceremony that feels even longer in the searing heat. The emir of Kano may not wield the power his predecessors once enjoyed, but the heirs of the house estates are an embodiment of history. Zainab Badawi there, and you can tune in to BBC World TV News on Saturday to watch the complete first episode of the History of Africa series. For now, thanks for your company.